Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is the student showcase for the Markle Center for Applied Ethics at Santa Clara University. We're very excited to be with you tonight. Um, if you didn't know, the Markle Center is the largest, most comprehensive applied ethics center in the United States. We have a great group of staff. We also are helped by faculty from across the university and students who we bring in every year as fellows and as part of different fellowships to do important and interesting, exciting work in ethics and applied ethics. And you're gonna hear more about that tonight as they showcase the work they've done. Um, I just wanna say uh, thank you in advance to all the staff students. All these students have worked with one of our staff or a few of the amazing faculty at Santa Clara this year. And for us, it's really sort of revitalizing work. It's exciting work. But, it, but And we have so much fun mentoring these students this year, and you'll see why here as we get started. So welcome, everyone. And I'm going to throw it to uh, David DeCoss, who helps run our Hackworth uh, Fellows Program and is our Director of Religious and Catholic Ethics. David? Uh, thank you so much, Don. And welcome again to everyone. I want to send a special welcome out to all family, parents um, of our students um, who are here tonight. It's just terrific to have you with us. So here's how the Zoom showcase is gonna work. Um, each student is going to present on their work for about three minutes. They'll have a slide that will help us kind of follow what they're talking about. In all, we've got 24 students on the call. We're gonna proceed through four different groups of students. First, the government ethics fellows, then the environmental ethics fellows, then the business ethics interns, and finally, the Hackworth fellows who work in a diverse areas of applied ethics. So um, during their presentations, we will have, we do have the question function on Zoom um, in operation. So if you have questions, please post them there. We hope to be able to get to some questions by the end of the call. So without further ado, let's get going and hear from these terrific students. Um, and we will start with our government ethics program. And to introduce that program, we have our director of government ethics, John Pellicero, former provost at Loyola University in Chicago, who has worked with our government ethics fellows this year. Um, John, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as David said, I'm the senior scholar in government ethics at the Markula Center, and I have the privilege of overseeing uh, the, this first year of the Government Ethics Fellowship. Uh, the program was created uh, with a generous gift from Luis Aiello, a 1973 graduate of Santa Clara University. This year, we have three government ethics fellows, and you're about to hear about their research projects on government and ethics. The presenters are three outstanding students, Grace Davis, Malia Gibbs, and Renee Sanford. Back to you, David. Thank you so much, John. So, uh, Johanna, if we could get Grace's slide up, would be terrific. So our first presenter this evening, the Government Ethics Fellow, is Grace Davis, a sophomore from Cleveland, Ohio, was a double major in political science and philosophy. Grace, over to you. Thank you, David, and thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. My topic is on ethics and education policy for LGBTQ plus youth. What led me to this topic was my own understanding of classrooms as a safe space for all students, especially students seeking safety outside of their homes, and in considering states that are more politically divided, divided when it comes to LGBTQ plus issues, which led me to my home state of Ohio. My largest takeaway was on preventative as opposed to proactive legislation when attending coalition meetings with lobbyists who recognize that in a political landscape such as Ohio, the proactive policies in more democratic states would not reap the same effect. Preventative policy is the route taken by most progressive or LGBTQ plus supporting legislators. This focuses on protecting safe spaces for queer students, such as confidential conversations with guidance counselors or the ability to ask for different pronouns in the classroom. 
The second most notable shift has been with anti-LGBTQ plus legislation from the Save Our Children campaigns you saw mostly in the 1970s and 80s to a parental rights politics we see today. In practice, policy strips queer youth from the ability to seek care and comfort within their school systems. Teachers, guidance counselors, nurses would all be noted as a kind of mandatory reporter when a child were to go to an adult to discuss their queerness, questions, and identity. The two ethical frameworks that I've used most regularly in my research have been the virtue framework, which provides ideals which we should strive towards and which allow the full development of humanity, as stated by the Markalis Center. When applied to this problem, to ensure virtue ethics is to ensure that LGBTQ plus youth or heterosexual youth who are discovering themselves in their own right can expect compassion from others and have the ability to engage in their schools wholeheartedly. With these preventative policies, the goal is to protect as many students as possible. So the common good framework, as self-explanatory as it is, aims to ensure community, and these preventative measures help to provide that community to all youth. Two recommendations I have taken away from my past year in research, the first of which has been to continue these preventative measures in Ohio, which has been the most effective route in such a politically divided state, specifically in regards to the protection of confidentiality. If a student were to go to a faculty or staff member at their school, they should be able to find safety without fear that what they say will be brought back to their home. The second recommendation I have is not necessarily for legislators, though policy does have the upper hand as to what can happen within a school system, classroom culture is still largely controlled by the teacher. Data collection on LGBTQ plus youth can inform teachers to be more aware of how they can develop the common good and comfort in their classrooms. Though policy may prohibit teachers from explicitly being supportive of queer students, data collection can better inform them on ways they can maintain an open and welcoming environment. Lastly, I do just want to give thanks to three organizations who have been critical to my success this year, Equality Ohio, Honesty for Ohio Education, and GLSEN. That would be three minutes. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the presentations. Grace, thank you so much, and especially for starting us off with a bold dive into such an important topic today. Our next speaker is Malaya Gibbs, a junior at Santa Clara, majoring in political science and management from Cary, North Carolina. Malaya. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. My project is asking the question of what does justice foreign policy look like in the United States relationship with Yemen as a nation facing a terrible humanitarian crisis. Um, I essentially focus on the descriptions of um, expe and expectations of justice, the situation in Yemen over the past 11 years, and the U.S.'s interference with Yemen on a foreign policy level. Expectations of justice in Muslim-majority countries place governance at the crossroads of religion, social and cultural norms, where governments must allocate resources to um, ensure survival and growth for both citizens and national institutions. Just leadership in these situations requires an application of Islamic values and ethics, regardless of democratic status. So successful institutions must adhere to normative codes rather than focusing on having a democracy. However, after the Arab Spring uprisings, during which the Yemeni population rose up to dispose of their um, hybrid authoritarian government controlled by President Saleh, or Saleh um, the United States continued to support that authoritarian government for many years afterwards in order to establish a economic and international status quo and in doing that for went justice. So after um, President Saleh gave up power, the United States helped install his former vice president Hadi into power and rebel groups almost immediately um, took part in a coup that disposed of Hadi um, and took over all of, of the decentralized government. So essentially all of the um, judicial authorities in Yemen are under this um, rebel group of the Houthis government. And these um, this terrorist organization um, makes it very difficult for authorities to ascertain um, whether or not the law is being followed and if um, the judicial system is being upheld as it was prior to the coup. Um, there have been many reports of unjustified violence, according to the council, and it is increasingly rare that um, the government provides defense counsel or full evidence, so defendants um, must procure their own defense, arbitrary deprivation of life, interference of privacy, denial of constitutional human rights are all common under this regime. 
And the United States, with the intention of limiting counter terror or limiting terrorism in the region, backed a Saudi led coalition um, with over $30 billion in arms, fighter jets, and intelligence, which have allowed the uh, Yemen civil war to spiral into what the U United Nations has called one of the worst humanitarian crises of our times. So my paper describes various methods of uh, justice-oriented or policy that the United States can utilize to improve their relationship with Yemen, including transitional and restorative justice that would give the power back to local governments um, in a way from both authoritarian and terrorist groups. Um, in order to interact justly with Yemen, the United States needs to focus its attention on judicial systems and implementing justice or to foreign policy. In doing this, the United States can better preserve the ethical systems that align with the international standards of human rights and alleviate, alleviate the crisis they're facing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah, and bringing to our attention this crisis in the world that we, we hardly pay at all sufficient attention to. So thank you. And our next speaker is our third government ethics fellow this year, Renee Sanford from Waukegan, Illinois, who is majoring in political science. Renee, over to you, please. Thank you. So hello, my name is Renee Sanford and I'm a current senior and a government ethics fellow. For my research, I've delved into the topic of racial biases and drug policies implemented by the federal government. Specifically, I conducted a comparative analysis of how the government handled the crack cocaine epidemic compared to our current ongoing opioid crisis. It's also really crucial to note that the crack cocaine epidemic had predominantly affected the black community, while the current opioid crisis is primarily impacting the white community. So throughout my research, I uncovered a striking contrast in the approach and treatment of these two epidemics. So let's just begin by looking back at the 1970s when the crack epidemic had emerged. At that time, the administration of US President Ronald Reagan swiftly prioritized what became known as the war on drugs. This initiative aimed to combat drug trafficking and bring an end to the crack cocaine epidemic. It entailed the passage of federal anti-drug laws, increased funding for anti-drug efforts, the expansion of prison and police programs, and the establishment of private organizations like the Partnerships for Drug-Free America to champion the cause. The underlying philosophy of the war on drugs rested on deterrence theory, which proposed that stricter legislation, harsher penalties, would deter or discourage drug use. Unfortunately, this deterrence was rooted in the criminalization of crack cocaine users. So the war on drugs predominantly targeted small-time drug dealers who were typically impoverished young Black males from inner city areas, and consequently, the number of incarcerated individuals soared with the arrests of both drug dealers and their customers. Um, shockingly, by 1989, one in every four African-American males aged 20 to 29 was either imprisoned or on probation or parole, contributing to the United States having the highest incarceration rate globally. However, in stark contrast, when the second wave of the opioid crisis hit America, we witnessed a vastly different approach in the treatment of opioid users. The federal government immediately raised awareness about this issue and humanized the users. The Opioid Crisis Response Act of 2018 serves as a poignant example of how drug epidemics should be addressed and reveals the disparity in the treatment of the crack cocaine epidemic. This act had introduced various programs and requirements related to the opioid use, such as support for pain management research, training for first responders, treatment and recovery centers, awareness campaigns and controlled substance regulation. So instead of resorting to criminalization, the federal government displayed profound compassion for this epidemic. So throughout my research, I employed the justice of virtue lenses as my guiding frameworks. The justice lens advocates for fair and equal treatment, ensuring that every person receives their due. Equal treatment implies that individuals should be treated equally based on justifiable criteria. So unfortunately, in the case of these two epidemics, the black community did not receive the same treatment as the white community. For the government to genuinely uphold ethical decision making, it should have treated both epidemics equitably. Moving on to the virtue lens, it posits that ethical action should align with certain virtues that foster the complete development of our humanity. And it can be argued that the federal government contradicted its own virtues enshrined in the Constitution, which proclaims equality for all in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So this is just a small portion of what I have been doing over the past year. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Renee, for telling this powerful story of two different ethical approaches um, to these devastating challenges. So thank you so much to all the government ethics fellows, and now we're going to switch gears and go to the environmental ethics fellows, and to introduce uh, that great team, we have Dr. Brian Green, who has worked with these fellows throughout the year. Brian is our Director of Technology Ethics here at the Ethics Center. 
Brian, over to you, please. Hello, everyone, and welcome. The Environmental Ethics Fellowship began in 2006, and there have been 53 student fellows in that time. The Environmental Ethics Fellowship lets students research a topic of interest in environmental ethics. This year's Environmental Ethics Fellows have concentrated on three areas of study, ethical issues related to space debris and Earth orbit, the ethics of engineering Earth's climate, and the ethical issues related to scarce water resources. The Environmental Ethics Fellowship has been funded for 17 years by the generosity of John and Joan Casey. Mary Ganahl's generosity has also supported the fellowship for the last two years, allowing us to expand our yearly number of fellows from three to six. A big thank you to our generous funders. Back to you, David. Thank you so much, Brian. So, um, Johanna, if we could have the first slide um, of the Environmental Ethics Fellows. Terrific. So our first presenter, our first Environmental Ethics Fellow this evening is Alec Hatan, a senior English major from the San Francisco Bay Area. Alec, over to you. Hello, my name is Alec Hatton, uh, and my topic of research was on the issue of space debris. So if you guys look at the left side of the slide, you will see an artist's representation of orbital debris, and uh, things are looking pretty crowded. If you look at that dense ball in the middle, that is actually Earth surrounded by thousands of pieces of space debris. Space debris is defined as defunct human-made objects in Earth's orbit, which pose risks to operational satellites, spacecraft, and astronauts due to collisions and debris accumulation. NASA currently predicts that there are approximately 23,000 pieces of debris, which travel at speeds of up to 17,500 miles per hour, which is fast enough for a relatively small piece of orbital debris to damage a satellite or spacecraft. And in 1978, two NASA scientists, John L. Day Kessler and Burton G. Corpolet, proposed the Kessler syndrome, which proposes that as the number of artificial satellites in Earth's orbit increases, so too does the probability of collisions between those satellites. And unfortunately, we can translate this to debris as the amount of debris in Earth's orbit increases, so too does the probability of collision between debris increase. And the issue here is that if these pieces of uh, either a satellite or debris do collide, there is the potential creation of a debris belt, which would lock Earth essentially into its orbit and we would never be able to leave, at least for hundreds of years, and we would be shrouded in a giant mail storm of just junk, pretty much just junk from old satellites and old space missions and stuff like that. And there's been some pushback against whether or not this is really gonna happen or if it's just a doomsday kind of scenario. But if you look historically, there have been some incidences of uh, collisions. In 2007, China conducted an anti-satellite test, which left thousands of pieces of, of debris scattered around the orbit. And a couple of years later, in 2009, there was a collision from a Russian satellite, which also resulted in thousands of pieces of debris. And it only takes one unfortunate collision to set off a chain reaction that would completely encapsulate Earth. So taking action to clean up the orbit is a matter of common good because it ensures the sustainability of space exploration and our search for interstellar life, habitable planets, and just our development of uh, our understanding in the universe. And thankfully, lots of governments are on board and there has been a lot of funding in companies who are developing technology to clean up the orbit. But there are also some governments that are not very committed to that and instead are funding uh, military weapons that would potentially create more debris. So it is a matter of common good to ensure that we can continue our exploration of space. Thank you. I like thank you so much for reminding us that applied ethics applies everywhere, even in space. Our next environmental ethics presenter is Brad Zuckerin, a junior environmental science major from Hawaii. Brad please. Hi, my name is Brad Zuckerin, and I research the ethics of stratospheric aerosol injection. Here on my slide here is a graphic of the technology. Uh, so stratic, stratospheric aerosol injection is a form of climate engineering that proposes the intentional addition of sulfur dioxide particles into the stratosphere to minimize the amount of solar radiation that enters our atmosphere. And the sulfur dioxide particles could be deployed using 
airplanes, balloons, uh, drones, pretty much any type of aircraft. And it would be used potentially to reduce or reverse the rate of global temperature, temperature trends, which are obviously showing rapid warming. And this proposal is quite controversial due to its worldwide effect and the possibility that it could actually rapidly increase global warming if misused. And I decided to research the, or I decided to evaluate uh, the research and deployment of this technology through a justice and utilitarian ethical lenses. And there were four main questions that guided my research, as you can see on this slide. The justice lens focused primarily on how climate change would disproportionately affect people in developing and small island nations, and that current projected emission cuts are not going to be effective in preventing extreme negative climatic events like heat waves, sea level rise, and droughts. But on the flip side, there's an argument that using this technology would encourage countries and corporations to halt their transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy since we would have already like found the solution to global warming. And the utilitarian view highlighted how this technology would benefit most humans on Earth due to the halting of global temperatures. And I say most humans because there is the possibility of negative regional effects of stratospheric aerosol injection. In addition, global warming also affects plants and animals too. So the successful implementation of this technology would have a positive effect on them. However, due to the lack of research and field tests, there is little known about stratospheric aerosol injection and what it would actually look like to use this technology globally, which brings into question if, if and how research and deployment of this technology should be handled in the future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brad, and utterly cutting edge ethics right there. So thank you so much. So our next presenter is Shivani Durrani Pragada, a sophomore from San Francisco Bay, majoring in computer science and economics. Shivani, over to you, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Shivani, and I've been researching whether climate engineering is actually implementable and if it's ethical to implement. So in my paper, I defined implementable as something that would be cost effective and politically acceptable. So I split the topic into three main parts, the cost effectiveness, the social political effects, and the ethical impacts of climate engineering. For cost effectiveness, I mainly considered whether these technologies could lower global mean temperatures by themselves fast and if they could do so at a low cost. The technologies that were considered cost effective by these terms were stratospheric aerosol inj injection, marine cloud brightening, and large scale direct air capture. Now, my fellow environmental ethics fellow talked a bit about stratospheric aerosol injection earlier. So, for reference, marine cloud brightening basically aims to increase the reflectivity of certain clouds so they can reflect sunlight back into space. And large scale direct air capture extracts carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere on a large scale. So after determining that these three methods were the most cost effective, I analyzed the potential sociopolitical effects of these technologies and weighed two main questions. Where are these technologies gonna be implemented and who experienced the side effects of these technologies? For the first question, if they're decentrally implemented, which means they're conducted by each state independently, or if they're implemented in a common space, which is a place where there's no national sovereignty, there could be some problems in coordination between these states. And for the second question, if the method benefits one country but adversely affects other countries, that could also cause some problems. So after analyzing both the social political effects and the cost effectiveness of these technologies, I then analyzed the ethical implications through three main frameworks from the Marcula Ethics Center. First, I analyzed it through the utilitarian lens, which emphasizes achieving the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And as climate engineering will improve the climate for most people, it would be ethical through the utilitarian lens. Similarly, through the common good lens, which focuses on the common conditions that are important to the welfare of everyone, it would, climate engineering would be ethical since it aims to better the environment. Lastly, through the care ethics lens, which emphasizes how individuals and specific circumstances are important. 
it climate engineering would not necessarily be ethical since technologies would have adverse effects globally, including adverse effects on individuals. So the main question that has to be considered when you're considering the ethical impacts of climate engineering is what you consider more important, prevent, preventing the future suffering of some people or relieving the current suffering of the planet. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thank you so much, Shivani, and for really identifying the ethical ambiguity around many different technologies. Our next environmental ethics fellow is Claire Carlson, a senior from Scottsdale, Arizona, and an economics major. Claire, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I worked on two different papers with the common theme of water scarcity. And so my first paper is about large corporations in the US and their responsibility to mitigate water pollution and conserve water throughout their supply chain. Um, I use the common good ethics lens to explore how water conservation will help the environment surrounding communities and the corporation itself. Corporations have a responsibility to act ethically and decrease their water consumption and pollution for the sake of the environment, stakeholders, and their own profits. Um, studies have shown that consumers are becoming increasingly more concerned with the environmental practices of the companies that they are buying from or investing in. So corporations have an increased incentive to practice conscious water consumption because it could help their profits and consumer perception of their brand. And there are many ways for corporations to effectively decrease their pollution and reduce their consumption of water, such as through climate forecasting or through strategic planning initiatives that are data driven and engage external stakeholders. Corporations have an ethical calling to keep the common good at the forefront of their operations so they can provide value for their shareholders, employees, surrounding communities and the environment. And then my second paper focuses on the Colorado River and specifically negotiations between relevant states to decrease their consumption of water and how the Navajo tribe suffers environmental injustice due to a lack of running water. So the Colorado River provides water for 40 million people in seven states and part of Mexico. And the river has reached an all time low level of water due to a combination of chronic overuse and a historic drought exacerbated by climate change. The Biden administration has called on states to reach an agreement on water cuts and California and Arizona in particular are struggling to come up with an agreement because both states want the other to reduce their consumption first. And you may have seen in the news in the past day that such agreements are closer to being reached. Um, and furthermore, the Navajo Nation, which is the largest Native American reservation in the U.S., largely lacks access to running water with as many as a third of residents not having running water. And members of the Navajo tribe have historically been excluded from negotiations of water resource allocations, despite also relying on the Colorado River for water. So this is a clear environmental injustice based on the justice framework, and the Navajo tribe should be included in negotiations as the states work to agree on water resource allocations during this time of drought. And action should be taken to implement safe and reliable water sources for all members of the Navajo Nation. That kind of sums up what I've been working on this year. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claire. And it uh, really kind of needless to say, perhaps, but important to say the work you're doing on water and ethics is of the greatest importance for everyone living in the American West and beyond. Thank you. Our next environmental ethics fellow is Valerie Joko, a senior political science and economics major from Oahu. Valerie. Thank you, David. My name is Valerie Joko, and my research this past year was on the impact of water loss and pollution on indigenous groups' identity. So my research focused on two case studies, the first being the Cucapa tribe of Baja California, Mexico, and how the drying up of the Colorado River is affecting them. And the second being very personal to me, how, looking at looking at Native Hawaiians and how they are being impacted by the 2021 U.S. Naval Base Fuel Week into the water aquifer. So these case studies highlight how Indigenous groups are uniquely, uniquely connected to waterways and the greater environment in multiple ways. 
Firstly, many indigenous groups rely on subsistence practices such as hunting, fishing, and gathering to meet their basic needs. For these groups, these practices are not just a means of survival, but also a way of maintaining cultural traditions and connections to the land. A profound impact seen in multiple indigenous groups that are reliant on these practices is solastalgia. And this is a loss of identity that one experiences as their home environment is changed, hampers their livelihood, or becomes uninhabitable. In addition, indigenous groups often have a strong connection to their ancestral lands and believe that the land is not a commodity to be exploited, but a sacred and essential part of their cultural heritage. Moreover, indigenous groups often have a wealth of traditional ecological knowledge that they have built over generations based off of their observations and interactions with the environment. Last and certainly not least, indigenous groups have a deep spiritual connection to the environment. For many indigenous groups, their spiritual practices and beliefs are deeply tied to the natural world. So while these are unique case studies of groups from particular locations with particular contexts, they can highlight the ways in which these water issues affecting indigenous groups are extremely unjust. So thank you so much to the Ethics Center and for funders for enabling me to delve into these issues. Well, thank you so much, Valerie. And you also put your finger on the fact that as we deal with all these environmental crises, the ethics we have learned so much from the ethics of the indigenous. Um, so thank you so much. And our final environmental ethics fellow this evening is Judith Lee. Judith is a senior economics and sociology double major from Shenzhen, China. Judith, over to you. Thank you, David. So my research is about how climate change causes water insecurity, which exacerbates the gender inequality in Uganda. So because of climate change in the far future, changes in precip precip precipitation will challenge the balance of the current ecosystem. But to local communities, the impact of climate change on seasonal, seasonal water supply is a more direct problem. The local communities are more likely to have unstable water supply, which means too much water in the rainy seasons and too little water in dry seasons. And on a community level, we, women are disproportionately affected by the water insecurity problem. Females suffer more from health consequences because of water sanitation and hygiene insufficiency. And water supply and what related water facilities, such as wells, boreholes, and water tanks are common goods shared by and beneficial toward the whole community. In 2020, a national report stated an 85% functionality of rural water sources in Uganda. So why does this malfunction caused by length of maintenance occur? This is a socio-technical problem, and it is due to the free rider problem, which happens when some members of a community do not contribute their fair share to the cost of a shared resource. So the resource becomes unusable. And two main, re two main reasons why this free rider problem occurs. First, people feel that it's not worthwhile to pay for the frequent breakdown and slow repairs. And second, People feel that it is unfair when village chairpersons allocate the water access based on their uh, favor, but not people's contribution to the collective funds. And to address this free rider problem, I suggest two main solutions. First, from a micro perspective, I suggest that the decision makers should value women's lived knowledge more because women are the main fetcher and main manager of water in the household. And second, I suggest that what social enterprises, nonprofits, and government agencies should provide training programs for women um, to take up the role of repairing and maintenance so they can be more self-independent. And second, from a macro perspective, I suggest that the government can invest in diversifying the water supply and water facilities. Uh, for example, they can invest in rain harvesting system so people can store and collect water in a uh, raining season and use the use water in the dry seasons. And second, I suggest that the government can invest in climate resilient infrastructure, which is designed, built, and operated in a way that prepare, prepare for and adopt to ch changing climate conditions. So the infrastructure can help prevent 
climate change induced problems, increase overall safety and efficacy of water systems, and save lives and property. Thank you. Judith, thank you so much. And you remind us that ethics doesn't exist apart from concrete matters like gender and inequality and all of these crucial matters kind of filter through those sorts of concerns. So thank you so much for reminding us of all of that. All right, well, thank you so much to the Environmental Ethics Fellows and to Brian Green for his great work with them throughout the year. We will now shift over to our business ethics interns and they have worked throughout the year with Sarah Cabral, our senior scholar of business ethics. So Sarah, if you could please introduce the Business Ethics Internship Program. Absolutely. The Business Ethics Internship Program places Santa Clara University students at well-known Silicon Valley companies um, in positions related to ethics and compliance. And so this past summer, we had Sidra at Intel, Antonio at Cadence Design Systems, Anna at KLA and Quinn at Marvel. And in addition to mentorship that they receive, they also get to focus on industry specific topics related to ethics. And I look forward to them sharing with you about their experiences. Many of them continued on after the summer to work for these companies in a part-time capacity. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you for all of your great work this year. So our first business ethics intern is Sidra Ahmed, a senior majoring in computer science from Fremont, California. Sidra, over to you. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Sidra. And this past summer, as well as this past school year, um, half of the school year, I was working at Intel. I had the opportunity to work there as um, a legal and on the legal and compliance team as a business uh, ethics intern. And I had a lot of fun with it. And I kind of want to talk through a little bit of what I was working on there and kind of what I um, had driven away from the company itself. So being at a being at a company like Intel that is based on the software, based on the AI, and especially as a computer science major, I really thought I would be doing work that was more catered to my major, work that was going alongside with whether it was a coding project or whether it was something that was just directly to what I was learning and applying at school. But instead, I was working on some other really interesting projects within the legal and compliance team, a team that I never thought I would ever have um, stepped foot into. And very much enjoyed my time in. So one really cool aspect of working there was I was able to compile end of the month reports for the team, which was um, especially in the team that I was in, in the legal and compliance team. There I had to basically conduct that research and analysis to identify potential ethical issues or risks relating to Intel's operations, products, or stakeholders within those monthly reports. So I was in charge of basically uh, developing and generating those reports and seeing what kind of trends were made throughout the throughout the year, which was essentially in the end um, uh, compiled together into quarterly reports where we were able to kind of see a trend in what people were asking, what employees were saying, et cetera. And we had this kind of database that was um, called uh, the ask ethics questions brought in by every single employee from around the world in Intel's database. So being in charge of a platform like that, along with other business interns at the time at Intel's, uh, in Intel's, um, in Intel Corporation, it was very exciting to be able to answer real life questions from real life employees who had questions relating to ethical issues or personal issues or anything within the company that I was very much in charge of responding to and talking to my manager and my team and resolving those issues. So um, overall, just again, uh, working working in the company, I was able to collaborate with different teams as well, uh, cross-functional teams through through Microsoft Teams, which was the biggest, the platform that we use at Intel, um, such as the legal team, compliance team already, human resources, and more. And we were able to support the identification and resolution of ethical issues and concerns throughout different teams. So it wasn't always working on projects in my team, it was working on projects in other teams as well. 
And finally, I was able to really contribute to the training and awareness initiatives aimed at promoting ethical behavior and culture across Intel's workforce, whether it was um, working across compiling a ton of reports from every single team at Intel and putting together a project for managers and see like just overall very like important people in the company. It was a great experience and I loved it so much that I actually continued working for them in the last uh, five, six months. So it was a great internship opportunity. Thank you so much, Sidra, for that exciting account and that window for us into seeing how a company kind of builds an ethical culture, one, one ethical decision, one ethical question responded to at a time. Our next business ethics intern is Anna Gallagher, a senior political science major from San Francisco. Anna, over to you. Thanks, David. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Anna. I was KLA's legal and compliance intern, and my main project that I was assigned over the summer was to complete Ethisphere's ethics quotient benchmark study. The EQ benchmark study is the basis for the world's most ethical companies recognition program. Um, benchmark results provide valuable information about how KLA compares to world's most ethical company honorees. And while KLA was completing this benchmark in order to KLA was not completing this benchmark in order to attain certification, but rather to see how their practices compare to those who are considered the world's most ethical companies. So in 2022, 138 organizations were recognized, spanning 22 countries and 45 industries. According to Ethisphere's Ethics Index, the listed 2022 world's most ethical companies honorees outperformed a comparable index of large cap companies by 24.6 percentage points from January 2017 to January 2022. This indicates that having ethical practices and a strong ethics program benefits overall business performance. The study or the benchmark survey consisted of 200 multiple choice and text questions text questions, um, and the benchmark study evaluated KLA across five categories, including governance, ethics and compliance program, leadership and reputation, environmental and societal impact, and the culture of ethics. Um, and now a brief timeline of my role. In June, um, I was introduced to Ethisphere and I identified respondents for each sections, for each section. So those would be KLA employees or subject matter experts. So for example, a person in the ESG department for um, environmental and societal impact section. And then I also researched existing KLA compliance documents like the code of conduct in order to answer questions that I could answer on my own. Um, in July, I met with topic experts that I had previously identified, and I completed all of the sections of the questionnaire. And then in August, I got the questionnaire responses checked and approved by the Chief Compliance Office Officer, and uh, I submitted the questionnaire. And then in September, we received the report from SS at this sphere on how we compared to the other world's most ethical company honorees. And then we took a few months off from the project, but I continued to work for KLA, working on other things. And then in February, I synthesized the report and made a list of action items by degree of difficulty. So in terms of what KLA can implement in order to have more ethical practices, um, and the report of action items was presented to the chief compliance officer at KLA. Um, so that's just kind of a look at one of the bigger projects I did um, at my time at KLA. I'm still working there now and have really enjoyed the experience. Thank, thank you. you so much, Anna. And thank you again for I mean, giving us a window into your great experience there, but also into the complexity and challenge of a, a, a company really implementing ethics across, across its whole framework. So our next business ethics intern is Quinn Gilman a senior philosophy major from Seattle, Washington. Quinn, over to you. Hey, David. Uh, thank you. Looks like we're going to have uh, back to back Ethisphere presentations, but I'll do my best to keep everyone engaged. Um, my name is Quinn Gilman, and today I'll be sharing a little bit about my time at Marvell Technology as an ethics and compliance intern. Uh, while at Marvell, I was tasked with completing an internal review of our likelihood of being recognized by Ethisphere as one of the world's most ethical companies. Every year, Ethisphere creates a large survey of questions which cover topics like board diversity, emission reduction efforts, and community outreach. The goal of Ethisphere is to compile a list of companies that hold high standards for business ethics. 
The companies that meet these qualifications are recognized by Ethisphere as one of the world's most ethical companies. But why do companies participate in Ethisphere survey? Well, first, you can look at the chart on the right and see that a strong track record of ethical practices is correlated with strong stock performance. Second, prospective employees want to work for a company that they feel is striving for more than pure profit. They want to work for a company that understands that its business practices affect people other than its shareholders and employees. Ethisphere's survey also allows companies to compare themselves to similarly sized companies and find areas for improvement. Where can we do better? What I found in my internal review was that Marvell excelled in almost every area. Our board and C-suite was more diverse than most companies our size, and employees reported that they felt very comfortable coming to superiors to report possible ethics and compliance violations. However, we did find that we lacked a set of rules for how we create rules. A rule means very little if it is created out of the blue without any authority to back it up or a clarity on how it was decided. While our ethics and compliance department was phenomenal, we needed a framework we could work within to combat the ethical conundrums that arise in a field that changes and develops as rapidly as the semiconductor industry. While Marvell ultimately did not apply for recognition by Ethisphere, I wanna share some personal insights I gained from this project. Um, my biggest takeaway was that company culture matters. Marvell CEO, Matt Murphy, entered the company in 2016 after it had experienced multiple SEC investigations over ethics and compliance violations. But since then, the company has had a clean track record, and I believe that much of this can be attributed to the CEO. He sends a company-wide email every Monday that usually has nothing to do with work. Instead, he talks about spending time with family, enjoying a good meal, or connecting with old friends. He walks around the office building and treats every employee the same, like a friend. From the moment I joined the company, it was apparent that employees felt a responsibility to do the right thing no matter what. Ethical company culture starts at the top, and Marvell CEO Matt Murphy has done an incredible job of setting the tone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Quinn. And you remind us also, we can have all the great ethical moral reasoning in the world, and it's going to come down to choices, what people do, how they make decisions, how they lead. So our final business ethics intern tonight is Antonio Amor Rojas from Mexico City, the Senior Management and Environmental Studies double major. Antonio, over to you. Hey everyone, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Antonio Amor Rojas, as you guys just heard, and I had the pleasure and honor of being an ESG and compliance intern uh, at Cadence Design Systems over the summer. Uh, my internships, I will say, is a little bit different from everybody else's because I focus much more on the ESG side than I do on the compliance side. Essentially, um, my role uh, in hand, like in entailed being kind of an assistant to everybody on the ESG team. Um, and it was a really, really good opportunity because the ESG team at Cadence Design Systems is so diverse. Um, it, it is um, formulated by the ESG director at Cadence, as well as the directors from a lot of different divisions from the company. So I was able to work with people uh, who worked in finance, in data security, in engineering, in marketing, in DEI, and I was able to consolidate all of the projects that I did in all of those areas to work with ESG and to put a lot of the data that we were looking for and in, like in investigations I made at the different um, divisions of the company into our sustainability report. Um, thankfully, I was able to um, make connections with everybody on the team and um, really enjoyed working there. Uh, I would say that the, the the crown jewel, I guess, of my experience there, I would say would be my work with the supply chain management team, where I was able to work with them to basically start our process of uh, evaluating our emissions internally within the company. Myself and two other members of the supply chain management team created a framework to evaluate um, our suppliers and what emissions um, we were responsible for. Uh, for those suppliers through our purchases from them. It was a very interesting experience just because uh, we used the scope one, two, and three um, framework that a lot of companies use to evaluate their emissions. And it is very, very new and very young. And so there are very few rules and like, um, you know, data available out there as to how to do it. So we essentially just had to make it up as we went. And I don't know, it was kind of crazy for me because they essentially put this huge responsibility on an intern and I, I really enjoyed it. 
Um, and it was really a great place uh, that kind of showed what the best of company culture can be, not just because they put a lot of responsibility and trust into an intern, but they made me feel comfortable speaking up in meetings with the whole ESG team with, you know, top level directors and sometimes C-suite level executives. And, you know, they made me really feel like a family. And so that's kind of what these pictures are. Uh, myself at the hike uh, with the rest of the team at the end of the at the end of the year, well, the day they brought in a cartoon designer um for all of the interns and my last day um but yeah cadence was a really really good experience and i hope to be able to work with them again in the future working on esg uh projects thank you so much antonio and you've given us a window too into not only your great experience there um at the company um but you can hardly pick up the newspapers these days without reading about some either controversy or the like around esg and corporate life and um, you've really given us a great window into something that's unfolding for our eyes. And it sounds like you had a real hand in helping shape what Cadence uh, is going to do in that area. So congratulations and thank you so much. All right, we will now move to our final group of students, the Hackworth Fellows. Um, I'm the overall manager of that team, although you will see that um, Hackworth Fellows work with different um, directors at the Ethics Center. So the Hackworth Fellowship was established uh, back in 2002 through a very generous endowment and very far-sighted endowment by Michael and Joan Hackworth. Mike was a longtime CEO in Silicon Valley, graduate of Santa Clara. Mike and Joan have uh, been, have, were for many years, wonderful supporters of the university and of the Ethics Center. And we are so immensely grateful for their generosity which not only supports the Hackworth Fellows, but also supports a very important grant making program we have here at the center. So Hackworth Fellows work on a diverse range of topics in applied ethics, as you will see. Um, we will start our Hackworth Fellowship presentations tonight with two teams of fellows who were dedicated to working on issues related to campus, the campus community of students. So both of these teams worked with Ethics Center Executive Director Don Hyder. And our first team up tonight is Callie O'Neill, a senior double major in psychology and French from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Kaylin Pedersen, a senior political science major from Chicago. So Callie and Kaylin, over to you, please. Thank you so much, David. We are super excited to share about our event, Restore with Roses. Um, so this fall, our campus ethics team discussed doing an event centered on mental health in order to commemorate the four student deaths that occurred in 2021. Um, so when I heard Dr. Bray Jones Copeland speak about um, how she had implemented flower therapy at Denver University with students and athletes, and how flowers have immediate and long-term effects on emotional reactions, mood, and even memory, I thought that we could do something similar at Santa Clara. So to pull off this event, we bought 500 roses and um, made a card that had one side um, stapled wellness center and mental health resources and the other side had different affirmations and quotes so we handed them out to students and it was all gone within an hour which our wish was that each student might have received the quote or affirmation that they needed to hear additionally we hoped that our event would call attention to the intersection of mental health and ethics as in order to live a meaningful and ethical life, it is crucial to prioritize our mental well-being. By doing so, we gain the ability to understand how our thoughts and feelings impact those around us, enabling us to live a more meaningful and ethical life. Yeah, I agree with everything Callie said. Uh, mental health is a really pertinent issue on college campuses, but we didn't want to set up an event that would require extensive emotional effort from students because we didn't think this would be as successful. 
Um, also, I think ethics are often intellectualized, but the core of ethics is kindness and compassion. And there's a lot of beauty and importance in simple acts of kindness. So we wanted to connect with students in an accessible way. Uh, when we were handing out roses, often students would ask, what's the catch? Because they're not used to having people hand things out for free. So I think that handing out these roses with resources allowed them to let their guard down and be more open to the resources and affirmations on the flowers. Um, and as Callie said, each affirmation was unique and included wellness center resources. And I feel like it really allowed us to meet people where they are. You know, we'd stand outside buildings, people were coming from class or going to Benson for food, and they could just quickly grab a rose and reflect on it and take from it what they needed. Um, people even started to ask for extra roses for their housemates or friends. And I think that it was just a great way to build community and remind students of the support systems that they have accessible to them. Um, one of my favorite moments was when a student took a rose and said, I really needed this. And I think that touched both Callie and I to see such a simple thing have an impact on someone's day. Well, thank you so much, Callie and Kaylin. And a uh, great Boston College uh, Jesuit has said that ethics makes community. And Callie and Kaylin, you've given us a kind of living demonstration um, of that in your presentation. Thank you. So our next presenter is uh, presenters are a, a second student team that worked on campus programs. And this team also worked with Don Heider, our executive director. And on this team are uh, Nina Uche, a senior psychology major from Houston, Texas, and Sean Graham, a junior from uh, Danville, California, who is majoring in information systems and analytics. Nina and Sean, over to you, please. Thank you, David, and good evening, everyone. I hope you are all having an amazing day. So for our topic, we wanted to focus on guidelines for using generative AI, specifically ChatGPT, with ChatGPT becoming more relevant and changing the way that us as students seek information. We felt that it was important to come up with guidelines on how to use it in academia um, with its popularity becoming more and more bigger, it's easier for students to misuse it. So we wanted to have those guidelines so that way we could tell them how to use it in a helpful way. And so we acknowledge that the software isn't inherently bad. And so we talk about that in our paper, uh, which was just published, so that's exciting. But we acknowledge that the software isn't inherently bad, but there is that fine line between using ChatGPT to assist you like a calculator or some other type of tool um, versus relying on it for complete academic work and breaking that dishonesty that we uphold at a Jesuit university so highly. Um, so in our article, we provide real world examples of when a student might be tempted to use ChatGPT and how they could approach their decision using ethical frameworks, some from the Markula Center on this website and then some also that we came up with ourselves. Um, but our overall purpose is this like ChatGPT can only be a useful tool if utilized correctly. And in that way, we only believe that it's useful offering clarification and synthesizing research or like large amounts of data. So offering clarification, breaking it down so students can easily interpret stuff. So we just put explain blank and simple terms as a way of how ChatGPT could be used to synthesize information. That way it's easier to obtain. And then I'll turn it over to Sean. Thank you, Nina. So I'll touch on some of the weaknesses of ChatGPT. Um, so one of the main weaknesses of ChatGPT is its potential to generate inaccurate or misleading information as it relies on patterns and examples from its training data rather than true understanding. Furthermore, ChatGPT may struggle with context and coherence, occasionally producing responses that may seem plausible but lack factual accuracy. And so I'll run through some of the questions that we pose from a virtue lens, which we thought um, can be thought of as uh, having our actions be consistent with certain ideal virtues that provide for the full development of our humanity. And so for the first question, if I use chat GPT to help in this case, what other shortcuts would I use? And so if I use chat, chat GPT to help in this case, I would utilize other shortcuts cuts such as how, uh, accessing relevant research and expert opinions to complement the AI generated information? Um, and am I cheating myself of the opportunity to learn in other ways? So ChatGPT can pr provide assistance, but it may hinder your ability to learn um, on your own. Um, and am I being the very best person I can be? 
And lastly, does ChatGPT take away the value I would gain from problem solving? So ChatGPT can provide quick solutions, but um, to truly develop your problem solving abilities, um, you have to work independently. Uh, so in conclusion, never directly copy any words used by ChatGPT or any other AIs and do not rely solely on ChatGPT for accurate information. And I am uh, uploading the link to our article in the Zoom chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean and Nina, for shedding light on something that the entire country, if not world, is thinking about, especially at academic institutions right now. So your, your efforts are extremely, uh, extremely timely. All right, we will now move to our next Hackworth Fellow, Harvey Chilcott, a senior biology major from Tasmania, Australia. And Harvey worked this year with Dr. Charles Binkley, our former director of bioethics and now professor of ethics um, at Hackensack, Medical, uh, Hackensack um, School of Medicine in New Jersey. Harvey, over to you, please. Thanks for the introduction, David. So I spent my hack worth on AI therapy. So there's a dire need for uh, medical health resources, especially for adolescents, because uh, there are various barriers in the way, such as cost, stigmatization, um, and just general under-resourcing. And this project was very personal to me because I had uh, my best friend committed suicide when he was uh, 16 and doing his... Uh, eulogy at his funeral was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, and I would want no one else to do that. So I think AI therapy is something that can be super impactful uh, in the world. Uh, as I said, there's a large unmet need. So one in 10 attempt suicide, and there's about one in three students that feel persistently sad uh, or helpless. Um, so what is Warbot? So as I said, it's um, a generative AI system uh, that's trained to implement uh, psychologists uh, therapies such as cognitive behavioral therapy and interpersonal psychopath uh, pathology um, and 22 percent of Americans have used a uh, mental health chatbot but there are some ethical concerns with uh, robot um, and these are outlined in the uh, White House's AI Bill of Rights um, which is a blueprint for ethical AI um, so I've chosen two of the principles being privacy and safety and effectiveness to work on uh, so with data privacy, uh, Warbot claims to be uh, to protect user uh, information through HIPAA laws, but they are widely outdated. They're about 27 years old, so they haven't had the chance to keep up with AI. So what's happening is that you put your most vulnerable information into Warbot, um, and Warbot saves that information, and AI can then find that information and sell it uh, to third parties, uh, particularly insurance companies, banks. Uh, and employers, which is an obvious ethical concern. Uh, the other is safety and effectiveness. So Warbot hasn't been proven to be effective as of yet, um, and there's not a lot of transparency around its effectiveness. Uh, it's also a Band-Aid fix. So people might get complacent with Warbot and treat it as an actual therapist, when in reality, uh, it can't quite do the things that a therapist can do, um, and it might hurt your long-term mental health. Uh, and also, minors cannot consent to uh, Warbot, uh, which is a safety and effectiveness issue. So the solution is to uh, have further transparency uh, where the information is more clear to its users, uh, enhance data privacy through uh, privacy enhancing technologies and again, further transparency and uh, having an AI therapist model where users of Warbot work with a therapist to implement the therapist uh, strategies through Warbot. Um, my project, I have written two papers, one on data privacy, one on safety and effectiveness. I hope to publish this in the New York Times and various other websites and papers, as well as an infographic. Um, and I'd like to quickly thank Dr. Binkley, uh, my mentor, Dr. DeCoste and the Martha Center for helping me with this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harvey. And thank you so much. I mean, bringing together such a, a painful world of challenges of mental health happening, especially on college campuses and beyond, um, and the kind of opportunities that AI presents us and evaluating those ethically. So our next presenter and Hackworth Fellow is Landis Fusato, a senior majoring in computer science and engineering from Honolulu. 
Landis, and I'm sorry, Landis has worked this year with Dr. Brian Green. Landis, over to you, please. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so the topic that I focused on this year um, was the ethics of YouTube. Um, so I kind of got this idea um, when a friend of mine showed me a like YouTube prank video. Um, it did make me laugh, um, but I did feel that something was off. Um, the comedy was at the expense of others, and it made me kind of wonder why a lot of these kind of ethically questionable things get so many views on YouTube. Um, so the first thing that I looked at um, was understanding kind of the ecosystem of YouTube. Um, YouTube is first and foremost a business. Um, so all the actions that the platform takes are an attempt to make money. Um, so some of the earliest descriptions of the YouTube al algorithm focused on this idea of unarticulated want. Um, it's a very concerning term um, that, the, that the creators of YouTube chose to do. Chose to do. Um, but just in general, um, that kind of caters towards what the recommendation algorithm is um, in the platform and how it wants you to continue to watch um, con its content in hopes of um, kind of making more money off of you in that respect. Um, so kind of understanding how the YouTube, YouTube works, um, I took that, I took those, um, took that information and looked at two particular cases. Um, one of them, the first case um, was regarding a YouTuber named Tumad. Um, some of you may have been familiar, um, but he was, uh, he's a prank content YouTuber. Um, one of the most famous things that he's done was when, um, during the pandemic, he did classroom Zoom bombings, which would be him joining um, kind of college classrooms unexpectedly um, or randomly and kind of disrupting the class. Um, so for these two cases, I looked at kind of using the Markle Center's six ethical lenses, which you can find on their website. Um, so the example of the uh, Zoom bombing um, incident, um, one that I, one ethic, ethical lens that I wanted to highlight um, was the virtue lens. So it's kind of being the best person that we can be. And in general, would watching this content um, encourage the betterment of society? Um, I would argue not. Um, it could instead encourage students and potentially highly impressionable people, such as children, um, to disrupt classes and disrespect their teachers. Um, so having this content on YouTube, I would view is uh, not ethical in terms of the virtue lens there. Um, the second um, case that I looked at um, was Nikocado Avocado. Um, so he is a mukbang YouTuber. Um, if anyone doesn't know what a mukbang is, it's essentially live streaming content while eating copious amounts of food, sometimes over like 4,000 calories or so in a single sitting while they talk to their viewers. Um, so as a result of this content, over time, um, the YouTuber has, um, I guess, gained a lot more weight since he first started, um, but also millions of more views in that respect based on when he started doing this kind of content. Um, analyzing it through the different lenses here, um, the one that I wanted to point out um, was the care ethics lens. Um, so this is more about the concern for others. Um, the viewers um, in this case, um, they do care, you know, about the people that they watch, um, but there is little way of knowing from a content viewer standpoint of whether or not um, that they would kind of see that through, except through comments and things like that, since it's very, a very asymmetrical kind of um, viewing system. Um, so our views continue to support um, this kind of content if we as, as we continue to watch it, which would further kind of um, degrade his health. Um, so for this reason, um, we th I kind of think that content creators should hold themselves to a higher, higher standard, understanding that their viewers probably want what's best for them as well, and us kind of viewing it in that sense um, in terms of how you view content on YouTube. Um, but if you want to learn more, um, I will publish this I'm on the Markula website in the future. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Landis, and I think you brought us, you know, sort of right into the present day um, and sort of ethics in conversation with unarticulated want and mukbang, mukbang content. Um, I, I'm sure many of us haven't thought of that before, but that's what we have to be thinking about. So thank you so, so much. So our next two students have worked with me in the area of business ethics, and they will present in succession one after the other, um, but they have both worked on business ethics cases. So our first um, Hackworth fellow working on this uh, team is Natalia Garcia, a senior economics major from Portland, Oregon. Natalia, over to you. Thank you and good evening, everyone. As Dr. DeCoste mentioned, my name is Natalia and I've been creating real world business ethics case studies gathered from the ethical challenges that Santa Clara faculty, staff, and recent grads have faced in the workplace. These case studies will be posted on the Markless Center for Applied Ethics website, where they've historically gotten hundreds of thousands of hits throughout the world. So to give you an idea of the cases I've been writing, I'll give you a short summary of one case about a recent grad that must figure out how to balance 
or even choose between job security and corporate responsibility. So this case is about Trey, a recent college graduate who is facing a dilemma at his job in the finance and analytics department of a large software company. He has discovered a discrepancy in the reporting of sales of certain products because the more high-end products that could potentially indicate stronger growth are being overcalculated. He realizes that this could potentially mislead investors and stakeholders, but he also knows that this metric is internal, meaning the company is not required by law to report this metric, and the company only does so to provide some additional information. Trey feels a moral responsibility to address this issue and is troubled by what appears to be dishonesty and recognizes the potential consequences of misleading investors. But as a recent grad and new employee, he struggles with self-doubt, questioning whether he has the authority or knowledge to speak up. He wonders, well, who am I to say anything? Perhaps I lack a complete understanding of the situation. To further complicate matters, his company recently announced layoffs. And as a new employee, he worries about jeopardizing his job security and ability to pay off student debt. Because of the current economic conditions, he doesn't think he would be able to find a job elsewhere. So balancing his personal integrity with the fear of jeopardizing his position, Trey finds himself in a challenging predicament. What should Trey do? Or what would you do in that situation? So in this case, we can see the ethical dilemmas facing employees when reporting wrongdoing in organizations. It raises important questions about the tensions between personal values, professional responsibilities, and the potential risks associated with speaking up. When we talk about business ethics, it's easy to think about it happening to others in far off corporations or in C-suite positions. But with this project, I hope to remind people that it can happen to any one of us at any time. We are going to have to learn the ethical decision-making skills to deal with these kinds of dilemmas. I hope to encourage students to apply the insights gained to their own professional lives and contribute to fostering a culture of integrity in their future careers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. And this excellent case that you've written will, as you said, go on the website where previous Hackworth fellows going back 10 years um, wrote a series of business ethics cases that, as Natalia has said, have now gotten hundreds of thousands of hits. We look forward to the work of Natalia, and as you will see in a moment, Yuvraj Rao being in that tradition. So our next Hackworth Fellow who worked with Natalia this year is Yuvraj Rao, a senior marketing major from Los Gatos, California. Yuvraj, over to you. Thank you, Dr. DeCoste. So for my project, I wrote a case on IKEA's fight to end child labor, particularly in India. IKEA is a multinational company that mainly provides simple and affordable home furniture and furnishings, and it pioneered DIY or do-it-yourself furniture. So I'd first like to briefly discuss how I decided on this IKEA case. Last summer while I was in India, my friend shared a video with me about child labor in mica mines in the cosmetics industry. And I was deeply saddened to see that children were risking their lives to mine for mica in Indian villages, which motivated me to work on a project related to child labor to raise more awareness of this issue. So I believe that this case on IKEA is a great story of a company's commitment to fighting child labor in India and throughout its supply chain. I also feel like it's really relevant to the times that we live in. We've been experiencing increased globalization and the pandemic has led to more communication being done remotely. With that being said, supply chain management is more important than ever, especially for large companies like IKEA. However, with global supply chains, it's often difficult to oversee and monitor everything that's going on in the production stage. And this case provides suggestions on how to increase transparency. So the case starts with some background on the company and the allegations they have faced related to child labor in their production. However, what I'd like to focus on today is the steps they've taken to limit and eventually eliminate child labor in their supply chain. I'll also discuss the ways in which the company has made a positive impact on communities in India. So one of the ways in which IKEA has addressed the issue of child labor in their supply chain has been through institutional partnerships with organizations, including Save the Children and UNICEF. 
Together with Save the Children, IKEA created the Iway Code of Conduct for Suppliers, which has been instrumental in maintaining ethical sourcing and having supply chain transparency. So in short, this code holds suppliers accountable for ethical sourcing through announced and unannounced visits by internal audit teams, as well as independent third parties. IKEA and Save the Children also developed a program that moved nearly 150,000 children out of child labor and into classrooms. The program also trained almost 4,000 people in order to provide each village with a community leader to ensure that the community had a skilled leader in educating villagers. Finally, IKEA has donated lots of money to address this issue of child labor in India. For example, in 2009, IKEA announced it would donate $48 million to UNICEF to help poor children in India. So again, the main goal of this paper is to highlight the actionable steps the company has taken to combat child labor in their supply chain with hopes of providing companies with a framework on how to manage their own supply chains. Additionally, I've included a few discussion questions at the end of the case. It's my hope that this case can be used in undergraduate courses throughout the world in the future. So the goal of these discussion questions is to encourage students to think critically about the case and how the concepts can be applied to other companies and situations. And I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. DeCoste, and the center for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuvraj. And if Natalia's cases illuminate dilemmas, Yuvraj's case shows us a way to deal with a really tough problem by a creative company. Thank you so, so much. Our next Hackworth Fellow is Diego Gonzalez Terminal, who is a senior communication major from Houston, Texas. Diego worked this year with Don Heider. Diego, over to you. Thank you, David. Hello, everybody. First off, what is pseudo gambling? Pseudo gambling describes the unregulated and predatory monetization tactics used in many video games, commonly known as loot boxes. These loot boxes make gaming companies a bulk of their profits and are packaged in many ways, all similar to opening a, back, a pack of baseball cards and hoping to get the best player. For context, imagine this. A child is walking through a room surrounded by attractive slot machines optimized to capture their attention and money. These predatory loot box systems often create a hostile environment that children, gambling addicts, and others predisposed to addiction must contend with, often leading to severe overspending. And I know what it's like. As early as 11 years old, I recall feeling intense urges to gamble using loot boxes. I still struggle with this today. My project focused on compiling realistic recommendations to address pseudo gambling that prioritize minimizing harm to vulnerable populations while maintaining economic viability. These recommendations are based on my own research and interviews conducted with various industry professionals. While there are several questionable methods gaming companies use to make money, today I'll be focusing on loot boxes specifically. And here's just how effective they can be. The graph presented shows a 2018 study that finds loot box spending increases with people's severity of problem gambling. However, once loot boxes were removed, the researchers found spending was similar across all users. Importantly, this suggests that problematic gamblers are only spending more when loot boxes are offered. Now, what can we do about it? As of today, loot boxes in the US are completely unregulated due to the fact that virtual goods lack real value. The US has the largest stake in the gaming industry, primarily in California, and therefore the greatest potential to address this issue from the core. Since gambling laws are made at the state level, it is imperative that California adapt their legal definition of gambling to include loot box systems. For game designers and organizations, I have two simple suggestions. First, consult ethicists as an investment to, towards long-term image, customer loyalty, and the culture of your organization. If your bottom line, bottom line relies on exploiting vulnerable customers, it might be time to reconsider your business model. Second, disclose loot box odds. If they exist, users should be clearly informed on the percent probability they win each reward. Lastly, what can you do as a user or parent? For adults, the first line of defense is to simply avoid loot boxes altogether. It can be easy to justify a harmless $5 purchase. That's just like buying some coffee. However, research shows that once you expose your brain to these neurochemically rewarding patterns, it may be harder to stop than you imagine. Of course, many people are able to gamble leisurely and unproblematically. In that case, try to reflect on what makes you want to purchase loot boxes. Is it a fear of missing out on the exclusive grand prize, the thrill of gambling, or is it just a fun way to reward yourself after a long week? For parents, if available, use the game's parental controls. They can restrict your child's ability to be advertised or buy loot boxes. It's also important to have a conversation with your child where you affirm their gaming hobby while setting clear boundaries on spending money in games. My hope is that this project will contribute to making the beautiful world of gaming more ethical and safe for all people. Thank you very much.
Uh, Diego, thank you so much for uh, helping us understand this world that uh, has many of these driving factors, but I think you've really articulated so beautifully the kind of connection between ethics and business practice and ethics and policy. So thank you so much. Our next Hackworth Fellow is Liam McBride, a junior economics major from Lafayette, California, and I had the great privilege of working with Liam this year. Liam, over to you. Hi, my name is Liam McBride, and the focus of my Hackworth Fellowship was on ethics and homelessness, specifically the human right to housing. Over this last year, I've done a lot of research into the homelessness crisis, as well as homeless outreach. The culmination of this research and the experiences I've had meeting with homeless people, homeless advocates, and academics has led me to the conclusion that we need a right to housing. For my project, I'm making a video series that discusses what the human right to housing is and why it should be an ethical obligation. The primary goal of this series is to spark progress on the homelessness issue in the Bay Area. Growing up, I was always raised with a sense of communal responsibility, and my parents emphasized giving back. This led to me engaging with the homelessness issue tangentially, but it wasn't until I got to college that I truly started to engage with the issue. In the fall of my sophomore year, I took a class called Architects of Solidarity, which was focused on building solidarity with the homeless in our community. My first assignment in this class was to interview a homeless person. So I went out into the community and met with a homeless person named Gilbert, who lived in an encampment near the Guadalupe River in San Jose. Hearing his story broke my heart. And when I got back to my dorm, I just laid in bed in shock for an hour. He had struggled with drug addiction his whole life. And for the past seven years, he'd become estranged from his family and was living on the street. Despite these circumstances, he was committed to becoming a better person and had this determination that I was in awe of. Learning more about the homelessness issue, it became clearer that while homelessness is in part caused by people's own actions, the overwhelming cause of homelessness is systemic issues. Over the last decade, the Bay Area has added six new jobs for every one new unit of housing. This is far above what most city planners consider a sustainable level, which is one and a half new jobs per one new unit of housing. This lack of new housing is the primary reason for the amount of homeless people in the Bay Area. While researching the best way to understand this problem and the best solutions to the homelessness crisis, I stumbled upon an amazing academic paper by Professor Emeritus Tim Iglesias of the University of San Francisco. In this article, he laid out the five ethical frames that guide how people in the United States view housing and while meeting with him on Zoom, he discussed a sixth ethical frame. Of these ethical frames, the one that I found the most salient was the human right to housing. The reason why I find it so important is because of how it modifies and improves the other ethical frames. Take, for example, one of the primary ways we think about housing, which is housing as an economic good. When we put a human rights focus, suddenly we are shifting the way we set up our economic system away from being all about promoting economic efficiency and instead focused on the promotion of human flourishing. Taking this further and thinking about our zoning laws, the human right to housing encourages zoning laws such as inclusive zoning, which incentivizes affordable housing by allowing developers to build higher density housing in an area so long as it's affordable. A human rights approach will help create an economic system that is leveraging the efficiency of private developers to build affordable housing. By putting human rights at the forefront, we can work to build a more equitable system and begin solving our homelessness crisis. Thank you for listening. And I'd like to thank my Hackworth advisor, Dr. David Dacasi, for all his help on this project. Well, thank you so much, Liam, and you've given us such a rich sense of uh, human right to housing and the urgency of the matter, which in the San Francisco Bay Area, if you keep your eyes open, you see that every single day. Our final Hackworth Fellow and the final student presentation of our Zoom showcase this evening is Vicki Pham, a senior communication major from Santa Clara, and Vicki worked this year with Sabu Vincent, the Director of Journalism and Media Ethics at the Ethics Center. Vicki, over to you. Thank you, David. And hi, everybody. My name is Vicki Pham, and I work in the area of journalism and media ethics. And my project is called Ethical Casting in a Racially Realized Hollywood, a Framework. So in 2015, hashtag Oscar so white was first tweeted out by Twitter user April Rain in response to the announcement of nominees for the 87th Academy Awards, where across all four major acting categories, only white persons were nominated. The hashtag then catapulted into virality, with folks echoing the sentiment of such long exclusivity, long witness in Hollywood. The years following, we're experiencing a period in which I call racially realized Hollywood. Now in the 21st century, it's apparent that not only are audiences taking to diversity in storytelling, but are dissatisfied when representation goes wrong. 
questions of who ought to be portrayed, how might they be portrayed, and who we get to portray them are all questions I sought to explore that demonstrate the intrinsic link between diversity, representation, and ethics. The past year, I've spent creating a framework for ethical casting in which a climate like today's, and I see a framework to be a useful tool since it allows us to circumvent common problems that often lead to such homogenous casting. This process differs from the current casting canon as it holds critical the aspect to a higher standard, expecting those to wield expecting those who wield such power to hold simultaneously the practical as well as the ethical. And it all starts with a single idea. One, the first point in my framework is to write diverse stories. Only when we have diverse stories to tell, can we even begin to think about the diversity we might add when we go to cast. Two, seek talent from a wider pool of applicants. As Hollywood has shown to be an industry where who you know might prove to matter more than what you know, conventional casting practices aren't just cutting it anymore. When exemplar shows such as Abbott Elementary struggled to find a talent pool representative of the predominantly young and black school district they were portraying, they outreach outside the conventional, calling directly upon the community and providing a mutually beneficial environment for the child actors they employed. Three, Advocate first for the actors and actresses that fit the description. Now, this might seem like common sense. However, Hollywood has and continues to fall into a trap of shoehorning a desired actor into an unfit role rather than finding an actor who fits the role in the first place. This tenant is most critical, perhaps, as it makes undeniable the priority that is fair and ethical casting. And four, diversity is not only for those on camera, but behind the scenes as well. Fill the room with a crew that reflects or adds to the diversity of a project. Staying close to my writer's roots, I have spent the latter quarter of my fellowship writing a play that touches on the casting process and how we might use ethics to help us solve some of casting more gray areas. In addition to writing the play, I also had the opportunity to play the part of casting director, which allowed me to put my framework to the test. For casting the play, I followed my own framework, the same one in which you see right in front of you, and I'm proud to say it is possible. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Vicki, and I'm glad you mentioned you're a playwright, or you wrote the play for this, but you are a playwright beyond that, and we know that informs the depth and uh, insight of your wonderful project. So. Well, that concludes our student presentations for our Zoom so showcase this year at the Ethics Center. We are so happy and grateful to work with these wonderful students and so proud of all their work. As I mentioned earlier, the um, uh, a recording of this Zoom showcase will be posted in the next days on the Ethics Center website. This summer, individual recordings of each of the student presentations will be also be posted. We'll close our evening now by going over to Ethics Center Executive Director, Don Heider. Don, over to you. Thanks, David. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this. I certainly learned a lot and you see why we have so much fun working with these Hackworth fellows. And the other kind of remarkable thing to me is that many of these students are taking very challenging majors. They're uh, very involved in other campus activities. And aside from that, they did this great work uh, on these ethics projects for us this year. I also want to mention on June 5th, our healthcare ethics interns will be doing their presentations. We split them in half because it just becomes too, too long in the evening. But thank you, everyone. Thanks to the students. And thank you, uh, those of you who dropped in to watch on Zoom. Have a good evening.